I recently designed um, two new kits um, in honor of my friend Cindy Lott. These are the candle mat kits. It's a kit of two. And this is Cynthia's Diamond. Uh, they will be on my website. I will have kits for them depending on when you view this because I only have a, a, a limited number of kits and then I don't make them anymore. But the interesting thing with this kit for me, after 20, 25 years of doing rugs, I'm doing something a little different. I'm using glue. As you notice, these are not stitched and they're glued together so that you can just put them on your, on your lap, on your board and stitch them. And um, the back is wool cotton works just as well but this is my very first time to use glue and I'm not going to go into detail about using glue it's very simple and it's on this video for the candle mats but I did want to do a bit of a teaching video because the reason I used the glue was because the pennies are so small. It is a half inch penny and a one inch penny and that makes the design. These are very difficult to cut just by hand and we do use a, a punch to do those but I wanted to talk a bit about, um, where did I get this one? Up here. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about the overall design. Um, the reason I use the small pennies and the reason I use the glue was because the pins got in, would get in the way when you pin it. The reason for the small pennies are there's a lot more color, a lot more design in a smaller mat. And that would, I thought that would be a nice uh, thing to talk about. Um, most of the time we use one and a half inch pennies and a one inch penny, something like that. But just imagine the size of the rug. If all of those pennies were that size, it would be quite large, a lot of work. <clears throat> With the glue method and using these small pennies, it just seems to be very easy, very easy to stitch, easy to put together, and you have a very nice design in not a large mat. Now I'm going to go over a couple, just a couple points um, with thread and um, how, actually how I dye my wool, how I get these colors that blend because everyone says that they love my wool. So I'm just going to give you a few tips on that. And I'm also going to give you a few tips on placement of the colors. You certainly can take a rug and just put your colors wherever you want it, wherever you think they look good. But um, there is sort of a system that I use, and I will show you that. There's also what I call the 10-foot rule, which is... Um, I set out my rug and then I look at it for a while, for a couple days. And a rug that does not have stitching and the overall look is good. It's not something that really catches your eye, then that's going to be a good rug. Unfortunately, if I look at this and I look at it through the day, and I also, if you take a photo, that helps too, but you have to remember to take it in a good lighting that the colors do not adjust in your phone or your camera. For me, these stand out. Those four colors, top penny, should be changed. And we will do that in the process of this video so you can see the change. Um, the other thing is, uh, I'll go, uh, touch a little bit on thread and things like that, but 
Um, this is my friend Colleen's new book, Penny Rugs and More. We've been together since I first started making rugs. We share everything, share all of our things that we figure out are good tips to use and we share our patterns, we share everything. It's a very good book and she goes into detail on many of these things that I will just be touching on today about pulling wool, thrifting wool. Is it really wool? Store wool. How to cut pennies. Choosing needle and thread. Dyeing fabric and thread. How to dye your thread, which I do. We do the same. So many more things. So this is a great book and I really suggest that doing bias. There's also a way to do bias and she shows it in here. Actually, it's my tip, but she does it all the time. She loves it. Um, how to not fold the bias with an iron. Very good tip. And so much more. How to do a tongue rug. This is the bias that you don't need to use an iron to do. There's so many more things. She goes into color, everything, so everything is there. I would really suggest that you should have this book if you don't have it already. Uh, I will leave a, um, a link in the comments below where to order it. But yes, it's a very good book. It's absolutely everything, even patterns in the back. Very, very nice the tongue patterns, the penny sizes, that sort of thing. So it's very nice and I think everyone that does penny rugs should have this book. So we'll go on to the next section. Um, just quickly touch on threads and that sort of thing and then we'll get into um, just some tips on how I dye and how I get these colors. We'll do that in the next section of the video. So I just want to quickly uh, touch on some of these things uh, that Colleen has in her book. Just touch on them. Um, first is the threads. Threads um, really play uh, quite a large part in your overall design. It For penny rugs, most everyone thinks you do a blanket stitch, but you can do anything that you want, uh, any type of decorative stitch. Um, there is uh, the thing with the threads. Uh, what happens if you have wool that frays? And this is a good example that's frayed there. Well, first of all, you wouldn't use that one. It's frayed too much. But if you find that you have wool that frays, you need to um, use your thread to stop that. And how you do that is you do quite a thicker thread. Something, this is my string. So you do it quite a thicker thread and you would try not to have too much uh, gaps between your stitches. You could do X stitches, you could do blanket stitches that are quite close together, uh, things like that. And that would pretty much solve that. I mean, there may be a few frays, but it's definitely not going to hurt anything. Um, what can you use for thread? Just about anything that's strong. Um, test it. This is not strong. So I wouldn't use it. Uh, some wools are strong. This one, see? The thing with uh, wool, as you would use to knit or crochet, um, it sort of wears thin as you push it through the wool with every stitch. And if it's not really strong, if you can break it, then you're going to have problems with it. And you could solve that by just having short threads and using them. but. I really don't like to do that. 
string. Absolutely. It won't break. <laughs> that should really test for your thread. Colleen shows how to dye string, how to over dye embroidery floss, anything like that. Um, I would be very careful unless you have a specific design with, uh, I, I really wouldn't use white thread at all. It just stands out too much. It's just too much in your face for the stitches. Once you have that all over, it's just going to pop white. Uh, the same with a very light beige. It will look white on there. Um, however, black, and I do have a little bit of black here. Black can work, and black will be part of your overall design of your rug. Just make sure that you don't have black or very dark in the in the rug. It has to contrast for every, and that's really the rule when you pick your shades. You can't have anything that's too dark now with black. I wouldn't use black on that, that stitch. It's just going to disappear as far as the threads go. So <clears throat> what happens if you have light, bright shades? Perhaps you got them somewhere from another project or something like that. Well, in Colleen's book, she shows you how to do it. It's very simple. You just age them a bit and you can reuse them. Um, you can do your stitches uh, the same as Maggie does with thread. Just make sure that you know, as mostly Maggie does, that your stitches are going to be invisible. Um, embroidery floss, good, depending on how many, two, two threads, three threads. There again, just make sure, you see how light that is? So make sure that it doesn't pop, it doesn't stand out too much. And there again, if you have them, just stick them in a bit of tea with vinegar and they'll, they'll age. That looks really nice. Just make sure that no pennies have that shade so that none of your stitches are going to disappear. So we've gone over that. Now, Colleen also has in her book about the masking tape, great for marking on wool. And I'll let you read that. It's just very simple. Anytime you need to cut borders, you put your tape down and mark on your tape with a pen, pencil, anything like that. So these things are all in her book and she goes into detail. So um, I'm just skimming over them and actually pointing out some things and telling you that they're in her book and that you should really have that book. <laughs> okay, the next thing uh, I will do is I'll go into um, how I get all of these shades from one dye pot. Um, I won't go into great detail and recipes and that sort of thing. It's just a few tips that uh, may help you. So that will be in the next video. If you are already a dyer, dry, a dye with, with the acid dyes, um, these may be a few hints that you could use. Um, everyone seems to like my wool and the colors that I, I get. Um, it's, this isn't specifically to have a dye recipe or anything like that. This is meant to maybe give you some hints uh, as far as doing pennies, how to get this type of look in your wall modeled very easily. Um, here's another one. So I'll just briefly go over what I do. Uh, as I say, it's not a, re not a recipe for dye. It's 
not giving you all the basics of dyeing. If you haven't dyed wool before, you will definitely need to um, find that somewhere else. Um, I will be doing a class on Teachable, uh, how to, with my specific recipes, how to do it, but that's quite later. Now, um, first thing, I want to give you a tip, how to get your pots clean. And, oh gosh, sorry. This one's pretty dirty. So I put everything in. I put about a tablespoon of this. Um, it has different um, brands. OxyClean, uh, I think Oxy is one, but it's the Oxy Action type of crystals, the white ones, tablespoon. Um, please do not boil it. Just get the water hot. You can even use tap water if you want to. And then a, a cloth, just move it around. I do put it on the stove and I watch it very carefully. If it, if it boils, it's going to boil suds over. But it's such a great way to clean your dye pots. No smell, very easy. So that's that. Now, um, this is the pot that I'm using right now. I usually do about two of these at one time. Um, I do my, you would do your uh, powder acid dye uh, as usual. Put it in steam. At this point, I put in my vinegar and my salt. I always use salt because the old saying is vinegar brightens and salt saddens. So I always use both of them. I put it in with my dye in, in the water. And then I get my wool and we'll just pretend this wool isn't dyed. These were blankets of usual colors like pink, green, blue. There is an odd time. This was a a pink one. Um, sometimes I have purple and I, I can use uh, dark colors in this, not all light. Um, if I have a dark blanket, dark gray, dark brown, something like that. So I hold them like this, hold them like this together. They are dry. They are not wet. My dye pot is on the stove with the dye, the vinegar, the salt mixed well. I just put them in like this in the water. Tamp them down. The thing you want to do is you want to have your pot so full that these cannot move around in the dye. Once you put them in, they're pretty much there. You can do it a bit, just move it around, but the idea is they have to touch one another and they have to be squenched, scrunched in tight in order to have those dark and light values. I leave the dye for whatever your timing is. Mine's about 20 minutes, half hour, something like that. Do not, absolutely do not have bubbles on your water, just steam. Steam as if you've just made a fresh pot of tea. That's about what it is. Um, I then turn the heat off, leave it on the stove a while so the pot cools, and then I leave it in the dye water, the salt, the vinegar, just as it is for about 24 hours. So the next day, around the same time, I would put my dye pot by the sink, and by that time it's cold, so you don't have to worry about hot wool. Do remember to um, wear gloves. It really does mess up your uh, manicure. Um, now I would take them out and put them on a strainer in the sink. Now the strainer that I use is just like an ordinary dish strainer. It is metal, but I suppose plastic would be the same. It's just so that you want it up a bit so that your water drips out of your wool. And it does quite easily do that. You don't have to wring your wool out. You don't have to have all these drips of dye water and everything. 
So from there, I put it in the washer. And the detergent that I use actually is the regular Dawn dish liquid. <clears throat> it's the kind that they advertise for birds. So I think if that's good for feathers, it's probably good for wool. So if I have two pots, I would probably use about a tablespoon. But my washer is set on the highest level, a full, full load of water, and it is for um, cold water, always cold. I also do a second rinse in cold water. From there, they go to the dryer, and that is where I think the problem comes in, at least it does for me. Because, yes, you need uh, heat to felt wool. You need to put your, your wool in dye, and the, you do need the heat for the dye to be absorbed in the fabrics, the wool. But with the dryer, um, there's heat and there's tumbling, and it just fluffs the wool up too much. So um, in the next segment, I'm going to talk a bit about felting and show you what I do. So we'll be back in the next segment. So why do I press the dickens out of my wool and multiple times? Well. It's not absolutely necessary, of course it isn't, it's just to your personal preference, but I feel as though the rugs uh, should be put together and ironed and have everything as good as possible. Ironing does uh, make the wool much better. I will show you some samples of that. But it's sort of like um, if you're a seamstress and you're doing a dress, a piece of clothing, jacket, you press as you stitch, press the seams. What would happen if you didn't do that and you did all of your stitching and then tried to press? Uh, it just doesn't work and it wouldn't look as good. So what I do is I try to press, I try to do aging, I try to do everything possible to make the rug look old before I stitch. Once I stitch, then that's sort of the finished part. And I do not use an iron, I do not use steam. Um, I do use water and I wet the wool, backing first. Uh, with this one, it would be I'd put it on a blanket see where I am. I put it on a blanket. I would wet that part. I would then press with my hands. Turn it over. The same but not as much water. Press with my hands and then leave it dry. At that point, if you wanted to age it, you could use a bit of the onion dye to uh, make some places darker, something like that. So, in a sense, the reason I can't get away from the dryer, that's what felts my wool, but I do everything possible after that to make the wool look um, finished. I guess that would be the word. Um, flatten is another word, especially with thick wool. Uh, I don't know if you can, let's see, how can I do that? You see how high that, whoops, you see how high that is. It's very high. It's three pennies that the wool has been felted from the dryer and not ironed. And it's a very high penny. This would be thin wool and it's a very thin penny. Well, the thing is, you really can't put those two together. Let's see, where am I? can't put those two together because you're going to have highs and lows after you uh, do your stitches. And if you happen to set something on it, it's not going to be level. It's really not going to look good. So if you do have thick wool, mix with the thin for sure. And absolutely 
try the ironing process. It really works much better. Even if it's not felted, I really like to iron my wool. So I'll show you some examples in the next part. So this is <clears throat> wool that just came out of the dryer and it's not thick. It's, um, it's, it's quite thin. The same wool that's been ironed. It just looks better. It, um, I'll just put them together like this. It just looks better. It, it's easier to work with and um, this is another part. This has the four guidelines for the candle mats. But to me, it just feels better. It works better. So I iron first before the pennies are cut. And I'll just show you some examples of before and afters. This is how I would, this is the wool I would use for my pennies. Nicely ironed and pressed. This is the other part of that blanket before it was pressed. Fluffy. I wouldn't cut pennies out of that before it was ironed. This is another example. Ironed and these are the little pennies. Fluffy and not ironed. These are some more examples of ironed. This one. These are the small pennies. And it's much easier to cut your pennies when it's not fluffy, too. Um, and there's another example. So, um, I wanted to talk a bit about the variance in the wool. Now, I've um, shown you a bit how I do it with the dye pot, but it's so nice because, for instance, these came from this. And when you cut pennies, you have variants of shade. They all work and they look really good in the rug, but they're just a tiny bit different with that technique. Here's some more greens. And although that's fine, just regular wool with no variants in them, that's fine. They make wonderful rugs. It's your choice, just your your likes and dislikes. But I find to cut pennies, it makes it look old if you have this type of penny where you have uh, shading in your wool and you cut your pennies. It, it does make it change the look of, rug, of the rug a bit. So in the next section, we will go to Cynthia's Diamond and I will give you the tips and tricks on how to choose your colors and colors in your row. Oh, there is one thing I would want to mention. When you're doing the dye pot, what happens when there's water bubbles on top and you boil it too much, it's too hot? with the method that I showed you where you put the wool in tight in the pot, this is what happens. You have um, wrinkles where the wool was in the pot like this with the heat that was too high and they really don't come out. This I've tried to iron, it just doesn't come out. This would be fine for rug hooking, I would think. I don't think that would be a problem. Um, pennies, yes, because uh, small pennies, those are fine. But um, large pieces, wool applique, something like that, uh, I just wouldn't use it for that. So um, we'll go on to the next part and I'll show you how to choose your shades in the rows in a penny rug. So in this part of the video, um, I'll show you some little tips that I use when I set out a rug. Now, we already have the variances in the color. You can see them here. 
they're not all a flat, strong one color. Um, I'm not really liking this blue border, but what I like to do is I like to have <clears throat> something dark, somewhat dark for a border. To me, it just represents uh, a photo or a painting or something with a frame. It sort of stops your rug. Now, in these, there is a bit of a dark border and then the light before it. So, and then the dark in the middle. <clears throat> so, that's one of the tricks that I use. The other thing is, uh, when I mentioned that you have the variances in the color of your wool when you dye it, um, I'll just grab a piece. There are different colors. Use those to your advantage. If you have, uh, say, only four pennies, uh, you can change. Even though this comes from this, it was a dark spot, spot in the wool, you can just use those four pennies and you have another color, which almost looks that way in your rug. Um, I have mentioned about the 10-foot um, rule about uh, whatever your eye sees is something that you should change. For me, it is these pennies. I don't like those dark and then the blue on them. The other thing is, <clears throat> in this technique that I'm going to show you, what you would do first is you would choose your bottom pennies. I'm not going to take these off because it's way too much trouble and I have to... Um, glue those for the next video and um, they're going to be sent to my dear friend Cindy so they have to be glued really good because they're going in the mail glued because she eventually when she becomes better um, she, she will stitch them. The other thing I wanted to mention is I've already said about the smaller the pennies the more design the more the thread will interact and uh, tone down those colors. But I wanted to mention quickly about the size of the pennies. We've all heard that pennies, penny rugs came from cutting wool from coins, from money. And that's probably true. I'm not saying it's not. Uh, money is different sizes. It just so happens that these are um, that's a one and a half inch. There's a little less, three quarter inch, an inch, that sort of thing. So that's true. That's probably true. However, I don't know where they got the two inch coin from. That must be very heavy. The thing is, you don't need to actually be specific and use those sizes. It's not a must that you do that. Anything round, any size, it can be one and seven eighths for a, or, or just something round from your kitchen. Just take it, bottle caps, uh, uh, something like that. What matters is the look when you stack the penny. That's the only thing that you have to worry about as to size. You're not looking at the actual two inch, one and a half, one inch, whatever. You're looking at what the penny looks like when it's stacked. So that's a common thing. Um, you can also have four pennies. You don't need just three, don't need two. Um, you can have multiple pennies, little pennies, another one. Um, you can have just that. You can have, see, that. And although it doesn't show up, but just that. You can have that a bit smaller. You can have this. 
and then you can do a decorative stitch in here and then just a blanket stitch so the design of a penny rug is actually your you're making your preference your choice it's not a set rule that the pennies have to be two inch one and a half one blah 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 um, <clears throat> so just remember that um, you are the designer there are no rules it doesn't matter if no one else does it it's if you like it if you think it's nice then it's going to be a lovely rug so just remember doesn't matter what other people do it doesn't matter what's in a pattern really patterns for these um, pennies are uh, I don't think that you would need a pattern they're so simple and try to uh, as I always do try to learn from every rug what would happen if I do this well maybe if I do this it would look better just don't worry about patterns, don't worry about rules. Stitch, enjoy it, and make some beautiful rugs. <clears throat> this I don't like, this purple. So we're going to change that. This stands out in my eye. Okay, take those off. Now, <clears throat> the rule of thumb that I have done is I have my dark here maybe I'll change that I don't know depending on how the penny looks then I have a light then I have a medium then I have um, greens blues something like that then I have another light which is the same as this one when I put my pennies on <clears throat> and please do your bottom row I would suggest ironing it if it looks good um, your eye doesn't go specifically to anything that shouldn't be there then this is the next step and the trick that I do the bottom color of this penny is the top penny in this row bottom color of this penny top penny in this row bottom color top penny bottom color top penny the other thing is uh, I do not like the blue so I've tried to not have uh, where do I have it not have every every one exactly the same I'm picking variances out and having different shades there's some here that that is purple this one is a bit purple it looks different um, that sort of tones that color down that I don't like Here's another one that's a different color. Can you see? Very slightly, but it does tone it down. Now, um, usually in this sequence, this color, this penny, this color, this penny, uh, there's differences in the wool, as I showed you. So now the top penny in this looks a little bit different than some of these but it did come from the same fabric and that's the beauty of having that uh, variation in your wool the uh, this row the blue generally goes here it's this step by step by step till you get here for the bottom penny and then you put it in the center i don't like that that's the part i don't like so let's try some other shades and see what happens. Generally, if you don't like a penny, if it's too bright, then you try and use the same color, slightly lighter color than the bottom penny, not a dramatic change. That doesn't look bad. Um, these I find are too bright. Let's give something else a try. Let's, oh, they stick together. We'll try this one.
it was this. Not much difference, but it still tones it down a bit. And it, then uh, there again, it was just another part of that piece of blanket. Same shades, just another part. So I really think that we will stay with that one. It looks much better than the blue. Where is my blue that I took off? This. Now let's put two on. I think I like that one better. But I will give you extra pennies in this kit, so just because I don't have a center like this doesn't mean you don't have, you have to use this center. So I think I'll do that. And do remember that the, <clears throat> yes, on camera it looks pretty good. This is pretty much the same shape I've used here. And do remember that the thread is important. It will tone down these colors to quite a degree. So what you're looking at is have everything looking good before the stitches go on and then it will be absolutely perfect. So thank you very much for watching. Um, please remember that Colleen's book, so many tips. I mean, I have just touched on a very, very few. This is an amazing book. And I don't say that just because Colleen is amazing, because she is. She's been my friend forever. Uh, even dyeing pennies that are already cut. Different types of stitches. Just wonderful. And as I say, the how to lay out, same as I'm doing. Colleen is amazing with um, natural colors and wool that's not dyed. Her look is a bit different than mine, but um, absolutely wonderful. And then patterns too. So if you don't have the book, um, I actually think this is the Penny Rug Bible for anyone that loves to make penny rugs, wants to experiment and do their own designs and has some tips and tricks that the two of us have done all these years. It's a wonderful book. Thank you very much for watching. Um, I hope in some way that I have helped, helped you. Um, please leave comments and I will be sure to answer them. Uh, and I do apologize for the quality of the video. I'm uh, pretty good with penny rugs, but um, I'm terrible with tech and video. So if you've come this far with me, thank you so much and happy stitching.